And now 27 years after her first album, Time for Mercy, came out, Jan's being inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. She just announced a Cross Canada tour that kicks off in May. And that new album I mentioned earlier, Hits and Other Gems, is coming out too. I'm, I'm exhausted now, but we're going to try to talk to one another just from naming off your many That's all the time we have. Enjoy your drive home. Congratulations. Thanks so much, Tom. This is a big deal. <clears throat> well, I think it's absolutely got everything to do with the accumulation of time. And just like you said, going into three decades of this, the, the nice thing is that I've done all of this stuff with the same label. I started out on A&M, it got gobbled into Polygram, and then Polygram was gobbled into Universal. And I've been working with the same people, you know, for the better part of three decades. And I think that has been such a triumph for me because I was able to do my work. At one point in there, probably 10 years ago, my radio days ended, and so they should. There was such a wave of amazing young new talent. The sounds were changing, the textures were changing, the geography of music was changing. And so, in you know, a lot of people would have been cut loose from their labels mm -hmm. and universal... You know, that income stream was changing dramatically, and they stuck it out with me. And they're still making records with me. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to start another record this year, aside from the, the hits and other gems of original music. So it's a testament to their steadfastness and belief in me, and it means a lot. How did you feel when you got the call that you got the Canadian Music Hall of Fame? Same gentleman, Alan Reed, that signed me wow. 28 and a half years ago. Wow. Um, was... Here We were here in Toronto, and uh, we were going to go to this function. I, I thought we were just going to this charity gig right. with my manager, Bruce Allen. Um, my road manager, Chris Brunton, and Alan came in. He says, uh, just wait a minute. You know, i got to talk to you about something. I was, like, getting ready to go to some art gallery, I thought. Mm -hmm. And he just said, and he got down on one knee, and I'm like, I thought something was really wrong. I thought he was retiring. Right. Proposing? And he, and he just said, you are being inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Wow. And I started crying. Did You did? Yeah, I did. I'm not surprised. Well, I just was shocking. Like, what is going on? Because you're right. It's 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 an honor. It's also a, a reference to the accumulation of the years. Mm -hmm. That must hit you as well, right? And the same guy bookending. How beautiful is that, that piece of time? And you had a bit of a hard year. Well, I mean, I think everybody goes through. Um, it's very cyclical obstacles. Yeah. You know, you kind of climb over, across, around. You do whatever you can, but it's just a, another. Another year of, I'm sure this year is going to be equally as taxing. I know, but I just mean, last time we talked, we were talking about your mom, yes. who, who wasn't well, and then and then she passed. Yeah, she did. And I'm so grateful. She was done here. She made up her mind and left in about three weeks. So anyone that's going through the Alzheimer's journey knows that it's very unpredictable. The worst case scenario for me, Tom, it's Tom, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a chuckle. No, the worst, the, the, the worst case scenario for me would be that she'd lived another 10 years and not knowing not knowing where she was or who she was or where she was. So it is, I was grateful that she left and she was so dignified. Yeah. My mom exited this world with so much grace and um, it was a real, really, truly special experience. I was glad to be there the last ten years. I don't her. think I don't think people understand what that kind of gratitude is. You know, I think that people I I, I have felt the same way that you felt, where I've said, you know, I'm I'm almost sort of grateful that they're not here anymore because you know they had a chance to go out the way they wanted to go and I'm yeah. not suffering anymore. I think it's hard it's hard for people to understand that, but it's real. Yeah, no, and she wasn't scared either. No, she was feeling I, I good. I mean, I talked about it when when you know years ago. We, my mom was very cavalier about dying, and she talked about it. Well, you have to think about it, or you just don't enjoy your life. Yeah. But she just said, why in the hell would I be afraid of dying? I'm not even going to know it's happening. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And she didn't. She just was so quiet, and she just slipped away. I had to say to my sister-in-law, I said, is she gone? She goes, I think so. My dad made a big fuss, but my mom just... Yeah. My, I asked my dad what kind of songs he wanted to play at his oh, funeral, God. and he said, uh, I'm the only person who's not going to be there. Like, so you he, pick it? Yeah, yeah, he was like, I'm the one person who's definitely not going to hear any of them, so why would I have a say in them? Oh, that's the best. Well, a lot of people are having funerals where they're alive now. Give me the roses while I'm living. That's what the, that's what they say. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, they're having, they know that the death is imminent and they're having gatherings of, let's do a potluck before I croak, which I kind of like. And the, all the accolades. Yeah. You know, even friends that hated you for never returning their lawnmower from they, 1971. They got to show up. You know, hell of a gal. <laughs> She was a hell of a gal. I think we should have one weekly. Yeah. For us, you know, I'll do one for me just like every Thursday, Tom's funeral. 
I'll start it off with you. I'm, I'll throw, I'll host something for you, Tom. You know, now that I'm a host in the CBC, it just feels like one every day anyway. <laughs> um, there's he didn't mean that. Memoirs, a cookbook, the TV show. I think there was a, I think there was It's not a, really a cookbook, but I mean, it, it, I don't know how, I mean, I was glad that recipes ended up in the book called Feeding My Mother because it, it, it certainly originated of trying to feed both my parents because yeah. they forgot how to use things like can opener toasters, pots and pans on the stove. So I had to cook for them. I'd rather think of that as a cookbook than one where I have to learn how to dehydrate a moose. Like I'd rather look at something like that for something I can maybe actually do. But I was worried with all those things, I didn't know if you'd go back to music. Like, I didn't oh, know if you Lord. were going to keep singing music. That's always at the heart. That, that's my the food pyramid for me. I mean, that's the bottom to all of this. And that's the only reason that I've been able to to do that kind of stuff is to... I think creative people are creative people. They mm. do a lot of things. And I'm not saying that I'm particularly great at any of the things that I try. Um, writing is kind of subjective. You, I think I write in my own quirky voice, in my own personality. Mm -hmm. I'm not Margaret Atwood. Mm -hmm. I wish I was. Mm -hmm. but Me too. Um, I'm not that kind of a writer. It's very conversational. And, and the other things that I've had to do, I, I have to credit Bruce Allen, my manager, because he just... He just gets me to try. He's like, why don't you try a TV show? Why don't you try writing? Why don't you, you know? Yeah. Um, so I, I have a lot of people around me that help to facilitate me doing all these things. But, but, but music is obviously something um, core to you or spiritual to you. Mm -hmm. like it's something and it's, that obviously it's brings... easy. Oh, yeah. It's something you know how to do. Yeah, I know how to do it. I don't have to rethink it. In fact, I've gotten probably quite lazy about music in the last 10 years or so. I don't... Have to, I don't agonize over it. I don't. I'm not fearful of going out there and playing. I mean, you can ask my band. I'll rehearse with them for like a 90 minutes or something, oh, yeah. and then we move on. Yeah. Like I know it. We all know it. And but I'll hear them playing for five, six hours on a stage. I'm just like, aren't you guys? Haven't you had it? No, we're, they're jamming, and these are guys that are well into their 50s. You know, late 50s, just playing like they always did. What were you listening to growing up in your in your parents' house? Oh, we were we were listening to everything. I was uh, I'm a proud member of the Columbia Record Club. Mm -hmm. And but uh, everything. I mean, my mom and dad had Sammy Davis Jr. and Nancy Wilson and um, Elvis Records, Frank Sinatra Records, and then we started getting things. My older brother was listening to Uriah Heep and Frank Zappa, um, Jethro Tull, and uh, all of that stuff really affected me. I was. ABBA, Olivia Newton-John, Carly Simon, James Taylor, Blondie. Yeah. Um, I was really kind of on that side of things. So we have a clip. Can we play this for you? Take a listen to this. What a voice. Yeah, Karen Carpenter is. Keep just keep that going, man. It's a little bit longer. Karen Carpenter is absolutely, like, criminally underrated musician and singer. What a perfect voice. Yeah, I was fortunate enough when I did sign with A&M, uh, their original lot just off of La Brea in Los Angeles is where Karen and Richard recorded a great deal of their work. It was uh, A&M Studios. Yeah. It used to be the Charlie Chaplin Studios, oh, cool. so they took that over. But anyway, it was a very... Those are early, early days, and I remember uh, a guy named David Anderley who was very paramount in, in, in actually signing Karen and, and starting the Carpenter's career. He took me into a studio where they recorded, and they had a crystal. Um, when you came in, it was in a glass box. I don't know if it's still there or not, but they said that it was quite a haunted studio, that they had had someone come in and put the crystal in there because they felt like Karen was still around. Like the ghost of Karen Carpenter But he said, Jan, there. if you could have seen her in the late 70s, he said, I have... And I remember the stairs going up into his office, into David Anderley's office, and he said, Karen, when she came in to try and come up those stairs when she was very unwell, he said was the weirdest thing, he said, because none of us knew what anorexia was. Yeah. And for those of you that don't know, that's what took Karen Carpenter's life. But it was uh, her voice, uh, and, and David would often talk about, it was really one take. Uh, in those days, yeah, they could punch you in and cut tapes together and do all those kinds of yeah, things you, with two-inch tape. But you tape. had to go in and deliver. You had to go You in had to deliver, and he said that she would sing through, and it was absolutely perfect. And, you know, her Richard talks about that a lot, but she was probably my biggest influence. Yeah, why, why did we play that? Why, why the Carpenter's Ticket to Ride? Why did we play that for you? I think it was the very first record I ever had. 
think it was absolutely the very first record that I ever had, and it it was. It was just something that I could choose for myself. And did you see like a path? Because I know you, like, you, you played your mom's guitar. Your mom was taking guitar lessons. She was taking guitar lessons. And while well, I played hockey, um, she played the guitar. The, they coincided. Sometimes I think the, the rehearsals or the games coincided on Saturdays with the, the preacher from the local church teaching beginner guitar to probably 10 farm ladies. Right. Because this was in rural Alberta. Yeah. And they we're, met in the church. Where in Alberta? Uh, Springbank, Alberta. Okay. Some people call it Rocky View County. Right. But it's not really a town. It's just a bunch of farms out there. Right. So, so the preacher was giving guitar lessons. You mm-hmm. were playing hockey. And it hurt my mom's fingers so badly. Like she played for a while and then she just gave up. And if you've ever tried to learn a string instrument, whether it's mandolin or ukulele, your fingers hurt. Yeah. I don't even feel my fingers anymore. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, right? Yeah. But that I can, first... lighter, I can put a lighter underneath them. You know? I know. Yeah. No, I can... Give me a knife. Uh, let me, I'm going to cut <laughs> off one of my fingers. Let, let me show you, Tom. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and so she she gave up. But I remember this big orange book, this binder filled with all these folk songs. And then I just picked up this the guitar that I still have. Uh, and I just learned guitar. I was probably 10 or 11 years old, and I never looked back. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just started making up songs. So you weren't, did you play like Blown in the Wind or did you play? I learned all the songs in the songbook because it had a, a, a little chart where you put your fingers on the strings. Yeah. And I just learned by ear and then just playing records down in my parents' basement because it was, it was quite safe down there. My dad was a big drinker. There was always a storm going on, but I knew he would never go down there. Right. Indoor, outdoor carpeting, no windows. But the record player was down there. And did you do like a concert? I remember when I learned to play guitar, I couldn't wait to get on stage and I played Lion Eyes by the Eagles oh. as part of like my, I was like 12. There was that, no reason for me to. That's very impressive. I didn't. No, I didn't tell anybody. No? No. You didn't I, get up on stage and play What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love or anything no, like that? No, when I was 18, so I'd been making up songs for, you know, seven or eight years. When I was 18, I played a song at my high school graduation in front of everybody. How did it go? Do you remember any of it? My mom, not not a word. Really? I might, might something, there might something be written down at, you know, on an old scrap of paper, but I have no idea. But my mom said, I didn't even know you like music. <laughs> but I was a really funny kid, and I just thought, my God, I'm writing such, and I still do. that. I, I haven't changed how I, humor does not ever infiltrate my music. And it doesn't, sometimes it used to surprise me, but now I know it was just such a sacred thing to me. I wanted to be taken seriously, and I just never let the funny into that. So you, you, you've you been describing it as making up songs. If you're just tuning in, I'm Tom Power, you're listening to Q. So Jan, like, you got a guitar, you started making up songs, but you've said that you became a songwriter while you were living in a basement apartment in Calgary. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Well, I, I'd certainly... I'd, probably written, you know, a 150, 200 songs. I don't even, I can't even keep score. You just wanted to be a songwriter. Place. You'd like... I didn't know. I just made up songs. It was, it was something that made me feel great. It was right. very liberating. I didn't, I, you know, because I lived in a rural area, I spent a lot of time by myself. And because yeah. my dad was a big drinker, I didn't want to go upstairs because I didn't, I didn't want to speak to him. I didn't want it to be seen. And, you know, I look back to that now. I wish I would have supported my mom better, but you're not emotionally equipped to do that when you're a young person. So I just stayed out of harm's way. I just, and that's what I did. And so I just burnt up all these hours after school down there. But as far as the the real songwriting part, um, going into 19, 20, 21, sort of those formative years, I was playing in little nightclubs, little places, and a guy named Neil McGonagall, I think I was probably 24, 25 at that point, he... um, saw me sing a song, a Christmas song at a country club called The Ranchman's in the middle of summer. What Christmas song was it? It was called Make It Christmas Day, which I ended up recording. I hear it every Christmas ad nauseum. They play it all the time. One of your your songs. I actually ended up recording it for like 15 years after I wrote it. But, um, and he just, Neil, long story short, he helped me get this apartment downtown. Yeah. And I just, it was a little basement suite apartment and all I did was write songs. I had, you know, a little tape deck, and sometimes I wrote five or six songs a day. So my first and second record were both written in that apartment. But I wrote hundreds of songs, terrible songs. I'll, do you still sing any of them? Yeah. Like, what's the oldest song you well, still sing? I, I mean, anything off the first or second record. They're all going uh, back to way but back one of the, the One of the very early ones that I probably wrote when I was 18 or 19 years old would have been Make It Christmas Day that I actually... We'll perform it sometimes at Christmas time, but yeah, first, second record, and then I finally, I was out of that apartment, 
and bought myself a little bit of house when I started getting some some money. And so yeah, that basement suite is it's cra- I st- it's still in my dreams. I still dream about that place. That's still that moment, hey? Like when you when you're writing songs, you're playing music, and and you just go like, I can make some money at this, really? Like I can I can do something with this? Why would I do anything else? Well, I didn't really think I could, but Neil, who who we we worked together for I think six or seven years, um, early on. He thought that I could, and certainly not even so much as a singer, because I didn't think of myself as a singer. I really still don't. I really think of myself as a songwriter. Right. And, but through default, um, I had to sing my own songs. So I didn't, I was in a small community. I didn't really know any singers that were like, hey, sing this for me and get a record deal. And so I ended up just singing them myself. I want to play um, another song for you. Take a listen to this. That's Lucy. I'm Not Your Lover from your first album, Time for Mercy. Yes. What do you hear there? Just turn well, it up a little bit more. I, I think, I mean, I sound so young. A- anyone will tell you that that's been singing for a long time. I think I'm a much better singer now. I mean, I know my voice so well, but I, I really hear, I mean, the excitement was so palpable when I went to cut that first record. I was working with one of the best producers in the world, Ed Cherney, who just recently passed away. I was so saddened by that, but Ed Cherney had just come off the, the Bonnie Raitt Nick of Time record with Don Was. Mm-hmm. He had just finished working with, with Clapton. Like, Eddie was at the top of his game. And, was that um, the Bonnie Raitt record that won all those Grammys? Yes. Like, it won, if it had something to talk about yeah. on it and stuff like yeah, that? Eddie yeah, Eddie engineered yeah. that. <laughs> Him and Don was. I mean, he produced it too. I mean, mm. Don was is on there as a producer, but Ed had so much to do with that album. So there you are from this tiny collection of farms in Alberta, and all of a sudden you're sitting down with, with people who of... work with Bonnie Raitt and Eric Clapton. Yeah. Man. And I didn't really know. Like, even the band that was in the studio on my first record, Jim Keltner, was my drummer. I heard that. <laughs> I heard a story that someone told me, and we can cut this if you, if you don't want to talk about it, but I heard a story that, like, you were in the studio with Keltner, and, like, George Harrison called... I think that could very well be possible. I, I, um, he used to wear John Lennon's jeans all the time. I should point out for people who are listening to this, Jim Keltner is um, <laughs> the greatest studio drummer in history. Maybe Hal Blaine, like Jim Keltner. Well, just pull on uh, Traveling Wilbury's record, all the Lennon stuff. I mean, he, Jim really, and he, Jim is very much still with us, and Jim is very much still working. And he, <laughs> well, they, they used to smoke pot. You know, back in the day, they'd smoke no. a little weed no. before they recorded. No, really? And he said to me, Jan, don't ever smoke weed. He said, you're weird enough as it is. <laughs> and uh, I have an old Martin guitar, 1952 old Martin guitar that I played a lot on those early records. And he uh, he got a sticky thing. It was like a, hi, my name is Fred. He, he got that from somewhere and he signed... He signed, uh, you know, what a great experience this is, and he signed his name. And, you know, further to that, on the next record, Eddie had me working with um, Kenny Arnoff. Oh, my God. Who is, but, but just the people that he brought in to play yeah. on these records. So, like, like how, how do you not have imposter syndrome in that moment? Well, I didn't know who they were. Right. I had never been anywhere. But even just to be in these I worlds, just, you know? I lived in Springbank, Alberta. I didn't know who Ed was, and I chose him because I liked his personality. They had me talking to the Steely Dan guy. I remember my first meeting with Ed Cherney was at the Roosevelt Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. A&M sent me out, you know, you have to meet these producers and just see if you click with them. Because I didn't even know what a producer did. I was very naive. And Ed sat down with me, and I remember we were both smoking. I was rolling drum cigarettes at those in those days. Classic. I rolled cigarettes. And yeah. We probably had a drink at the bar, and um, I was had just turned 30 years old. So I was quite late to coming into all of this to begin with. But Ed said to me, you know who you should get to produce your record? He was trying to sell this job. Larry Klein. You know Larry Klein, Joni Mitchell's partner. La- Larry should produce your record. He's so great, and he's and he he plays bass really good too. Jane, I go, it's Jan. Whatever. <laughs> and uh, what's going through your head? Are you just going like, oh, all honest right. to God, it's such a blur. But he he just and then finally he said to me, I'm good at clearing the way, and I went on to speak to another sixteen or seventeen producers after that point. So many people. Yeah. John Leventhal, the guy from Steely Dan, like I said, and, and just all these amazing people. And I said to them at the end of this month, I said, I like Ed. 
he made me laugh, and we went on to work together for a decade. So there, there. I mean, it's it's. It's still amazing that all this happened, but it's also not amazing because these songs were really, really, really good. What's equally amazing as all of this, by the way, is that I, th- I think if you're not in the music industry and you're listening to this, there's something Jan said so earlier. I hope we're not being too, too word name droppy because oh, yeah. I know they might not mean anything to anybody, but the, he was a really good producer. They're going to cut this down to like three and a half minutes. Okay. Don't worry about okay, it. Okay, It'll be great. Yeah, it's great. Gonna, we're going to get this. Jan over there, she's going to cut this down to two and a half, three minutes. It's going to be incredible. It's 90 seconds, right? Yeah, we'll get that down to that. Okay, T- good. Tight 90. Oh, I like a 90-second interview. Um, what's If you're not in the music industry, there's something that Jan said earlier that may not have been as remarkable to you, is that she's working with the same band, like the same people, the same industry people for 20, 30 years. Yeah. No one does that. No one works with people that long. I have a great story that will absolutely, just in one or two sentences... Sum up the Canadian music industry. No, I'm all right. Stop it, Tony. <laughs> I hosted the Junos 20 years apart. Yeah. I hosted them in 1996, and then I hosted them in two, 2016 with another wonderful fellow. And the same person that saw me on stage in 1996 was the same woman, Anne, who got me on stage 20 years later. So if you choose to live your life in a way that is the least bit abusive verbally or negative or that you're just not plain fair you're not gonna you're not gonna survive it because it, that's how small it is and I could say the same thing Alan signing me and being the man inducting me into the Hall of Fame yeah and Anne I, I work with the same te- the same cameraman a guy named Don who did all the great stuff with Rick Mercer and I all those years one of the best cameramen in the business um, Film me winning every Juno I ever had. It was Don standing in front of me with his camera. So what do you what do you attribute that What do you attribute that to yourself? Like what did you do? Is it that you? I just was myself. I I've never. I, I think I I think I'm a, a nice person. I've yeah. just tried to be a nice person. And I working with the same people has meant everything to me. I work with so many of the same people at Universal. Some of them started there in the warehouse, and they're like in much bigger positions at Universal than they were back then. So, you know, I don't have a big bang. I don't have a discovery story for you. I don't, you know, where were you discovered? I don't have any of that. I have thousands of seemingly insignificant events <clears throat> that as I look back, just knock together. And that's what's made my career. It's not any big thing. I don't, you know, I'm not really well known internationally. I mean, obviously Canada is a country that I've done very well and I've had some international success, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not that. Just take a listen to this. Um, everything up till now has been me practicing to kind of be this version of myself, if that makes any sense. In my 20s, I honestly did not know my arse from a watermelon. In my 30s, I was more or less drunk and rolling through the prairies on a tour bus. Uh, My 40s were spent lamenting the lost time in my 20s and 30s (laughs) and regretting that. And now in my 50s, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I can stop trying so hard and just write down good words that I know to be true. And I can do my art without worrying about what anybody's going to think about it. That's Jan Arden being inducted into the Canadian Music Industry Hall of Fame, which is different than the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. I'm going to use that speech again. That was a good one. Which is pretty pretty confusing. That is a great speech. But what <laughs> I what I really like about it, I mean, is that is that last chapter. Well, I I do love in the 40, you know, in your 40s you oh, yeah, worry you, about everything that happened in your yeah. 20s, but in your 50s you're just like, thank God, I don't have to worry about anything. All I have to do is write songs. Do you still feel that freedom? Oh, very much so. I do I have no pressure going into writing anything now. And, and Universal, I, ha- I have to give them credit because, you know, they're, they're in the music business. They are in a business of, of monetizing artists and they have to make money in order to survive. They have yeah. to figure out how to sell their music. They don't, I have no pressure, let's write a three-minute single that's going to be on top 100. That's not how I work anymore. I literally write what I write. I write with great people like Bob Rock. I write with great people like Russ Broom. And I, I just... Don't even think about it. I don't think about it if it's five minutes and 13 seconds. I don't think about, oh, we should take that verse out. I, it's so liberating to be able to just um, not edit myself. I, so it, it, and I've, but I've earned it. I've earned my way. Mm. So I, I never, I always think like, yes, you are very deserving of this time in your life. 
I never, I am the crone coming out of the trees. There's something that happens to women, especially as they age. They let go of their, their, their constant um, evaluation of their physical selves, their bodies, their legs, their breasts, their butt, their, you know, what my arms look like, your physical appearance. It's not, I'm not saying that I don't care that I'm like, oh, I don't, I'll just wear these sweatpants with skid marks on them mm -hmm. and go to the store to get me some fruit. Yeah. I couldn't think of what I was going to say there, Tom. I, I, was, I, I could help you out, you yeah, know, eggs, I was waiting for you eggs to get, chocolate. I but I figured, you know what? You were on a good path there, and it seemed to be getting a little spiritual, so I didn't want to stand in the way. I didn't want to interrupt the flow. I felt like the Lord was coming through. I don't want to get in the way of the Lord. I don't want to do it. Thank you. Not that kind of guy. No, you're not. Yeah, I'm letting the Lord come in. Yes. Thank you. Anyway, it continues. It. No, that was it. No, it's you, not. You finished it. For, but I mean, I, I just don't, I, if you're not beside me, get out of my way. I... Don't worry about failing. Yeah. I don't mind it a bit. I am sitting here because of failure. I'm sitting here because, uh, you know, you dare to try things and dare to do things. I have made so many mistakes. I've hurt people. I've hurt my own body. I was drunk for a long time. It's taken me probably the last three or four years to reconcile how much I drank. It still shocks me. Like, it really does. I'm like, what was I thinking? But I wasn't thinking. I was just... You get into the state of denial where you really can sit, you can sit, go to bed at night, like half plastered and go, I only had seven drinks and, and qualify that as normal behavior. Yeah. So coming out the other side of that, of course I'm filled with gratitude. Yeah. I could have killed myself. I could have injured other people just driving and, um. How, how long now? You, you I've been sober. I'm going into year four. Year four. Yeah. Every day, but year four. Yeah. I mean, I will never drink again. I was, and I had sober periods in my life. And then I would sneak back into it. Yeah. I always say to people now, if you think you drink too much, you are drinking too much. Right. If you have that thought. Yeah. I mean, I, I was very lucky, but my dad, I spent my youth and my 20s and my 30s not wanting to be like my dad. And I turned out like my dad. Yeah. But I was enough like my mother. Mm -hmm. That's why they gave us two parents. Ah, uh, yeah. So you can- Not just the one. You can learn from the mistakes of one. Whew. Yeah. I, and her, she was- so filled with grace. She didn't have, she had one drink a week. I mean, she just, I don't yeah. know how she put up with do you, the man. Do you, do you think that writing, like writing songs, do you think you would have been able to weather this stuff if you weren't able to write songs? It saved me. Yeah? Music saved me. It saved me from my demise that would not have been good. My older brother's been in jail for 27 years. Yeah, I know that. So his journey with my dad's alcoholism was far different than mine. I think music just kept picking me up and dusting me off and setting me back on a road. Um, and, and my brother Dre just, he just wanted to please my dad and he, he, just, he just succumbed to it, the, the disease and pills. And he, he, he always wanted my dad's approval. And I think it's much different for boys than girls. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what, I, but I had the wherewithal to go into the basement and mm -hmm. stay out of his way. And my little brother was five years younger than me and eight years younger than my older brother. So I think by the time Patrick was coming up through his formative years, I mean, we've just talked about this now, his experience, we, we all had th three different sets of parents. Yeah. But that must make you feel a bit funny, you know, seeing yeah. your, your brother's in jail and you're at, you, you know, yeah, on, on it, tour and doing that stuff that well, must... Well, never mind that. I, I got my record deal and he was charged with first degree murder in the same month. How do, how do a set of parents navigate that? And how, do, how do you feel good celebrating it? How do you feel good celebrating anything when something like that's going on? You life? just have to find it. You have to find the joy. Yeah. I'm not... I'm not and, and, I, and I have to preface this all by saying that my brother has always maintained his innocence of yeah. that crime. Yeah. And I think you and I have touched on that before. We have, yeah. So, and I believe him full heartedly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's time for him to, to come home and get out of there. Mm -hmm. what, before my mom died, I told her that he was out. Oh, she had was Alzheimer's. Very, very well, kind of you. That's a gift. Yeah. Well, where is he ever going to get out of there? I said, he's out, mom. He's using all your doilies. <laughs> oh my God. He's such a good homemaker. He was always a good homemaker. What, what, a, what a gift. What a gift that is to give to your mother. What a, that's a true she gift. She believed it. And I thought, you feel a little bit bad about lying, yeah. but I, it was the best lie I ever told. And I've told a few really good zingers in my day, but that was a good one. I heard you got a new tattoo. I did. You got a sleeve. Can you? Can I see it? Well, yeah. I, 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 I know I you got know. a bit of a Jack Sparrow thing happening here right now, but can I? I need to take my clothes off. Here's part of it. <laughs> it's my parents' Do you names. want to get in here? 
It's my parents' names. I'm actually going to get more done on the trees while I'm here in I'm Toronto. Saying, feel like you can. By Don't worry Pauline about it. Pauline on Young there. Street Tattoo. So let me sh- let me it, see it. It, it. It's it's trees. So I live in a forest, and then my mom and dad's names, and just some trees. But I, it hurts so bad. I just. I mean, I don't know how I made it to this age without having a tattoo, but yeah. I did. And then don't don't start off with something big. No. Get something. Get, you got a hipster get, tattoo. You got a sleeve. I, Tom, I was so shocked when I saw it. I was kind of, I had buyer's remorse for, oh, maybe the first month. It's, it's like you're cooking in a gastro pub. Oh, my God. I, I'm <laughs> I'm so cool now. I actually feel, I mean, I could be Kathleen Edwards now. You're Scott Hellman. Because she's cool. I could be Scott Hellman. Um, you're going on tour. I am. I'm I'm excited about this. May June. I'm. A, do you know what? I haven't played Newfoundland for since I turned f- my 40th birthday was in Newfoundland the last time I played there, and I'm about to be 58. Um, so yeah, it's been 18 years since I was in Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. Are you excited about I, getting back on the I, road? I know people love the shows. Oh, I love it. You it's love it? It's great. The band is such an amazing group of people, and we just laugh. It's very conversational. Um, yeah, I'm amazed people still show up. Well, thank God I know. that people still come and see you play. Because your dad and I, I don't think we can sit through another one of your shows. <laughs> because it's its the same as last year, right? But I feel like you set up a template for people, like Rose Cousins and Donovan Woods, to be like really, really funny and then sing the most devastating song you've That's ever heard in your life. That's the only way it works. Yeah. Yeah. The pendulum only sw- works the clock because it goes back and forth. It goes high and low. So if you want the clock to tick, you got to go up and down. When you get up on stage to get the Canadian Music Hall of Fame thing at the Junos, are you going to do a song or anything? Like you going to do a couple songs? Or I'm, I believe they're having me do Good Mother. Oh, jam! I think I think that I think that closes out the show with Good Mother. So hopefully we'll all get through it unscathed. People always say, "Why don't you cry all the time?" I'm like, "No, I'm not. I don't cry at that anymore. I would never be able to do it." It's hard to have the presence <clears throat> of mind in those moments, but if you were to try and have it, what do you mm-hmm. think is going to be going through your head as you get that award? I don't think I'll be fearful. I kind of. It's so funny when I when I quit drinking, my depression and anxiety went away. Oh, what a surprise! What it does to the human body. And uh, so I'm quite cavalier when I go out now. So I don't think I'll be nervous. I think I'm just going to take it in. I mean, I really feel like I'm just getting started. I the industry has changed so much since I started out. You know, even when I was in the bars when I was 20. When I was 20, it was Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, Leonard Cohen, the Guess Who. Um, it was this this Gordon Lightfoot. It was a handful of Anne Murray of people that were making music. And we thought, like, the industry was 10 people. Now there is thousands, mm. thousands of young men and women that are making the most incredible music, many of which you you talk to as many of them as you can, and I appreciate that. And many many of whom looked at you as an, as a as a path. Oh my God! I think those I, poor people. I, I know him. I know him. I know him for. Uh, I but I mean, it was just I. I got lucky, but I think you know it's it isn't it about being the best or or even talent for that matter. It is about being conscious of being persistent. Mm-hmm. Don't stop doing it. Mm-hmm. You will find somebody that likes what you're doing. Yeah. It might be four people, but keep doing it. Jan, congratulations. Thank you very much. Nice to talk. Yeah, it was, I'm very honored. I love talking to you. I love talking to you too. I've been looking forward to this.